scripture today is Isaiah 40, 1 through 5, 11, 28, and 31. Com comfort my people, say your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed and that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of all calling in the deep desert prepared the way for the Lord, make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low, the rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. <clears throat> he tends his flocks like a shepherd, he gathers the lambs in his arms, and he carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding to one can fathom. He carry, gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles, and they will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Just for the fun of it, we're beginning each of our Advent messages by recalling a Christmas song. Now, some of these songs are secular and some are sacred. Our song for this Sunday is several decades old. It was first sung by a young rock and roller named Elvis Presley. I don't know if you remember him or not. <laughs> but of course, Elvis sang, I'll have a blue, 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 blue Christmas without you. I hope I put in a sufficient number of blues for those of you diehard Presley fans. However, I felt that Blue Christmas would fit in with Isaiah 40, which begins, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. It's a great theme for our second Sunday in Advent. Comfort. Comfort. You know, not everyone is full of cheer at Christmas. In fact, this is a season when depression is at a peak for some people. There's another popular song I've chose, I did not choose for this Sunday. It's called, it's a tearjerker, and it's titled, Please, Daddy, Don't Get Drunk This Christmas. So this one didn't reach the popularity that Blue Christmas did, but I'll bet that most of you can, can't guess who sang this Christmas classic. It was a late, great folk singer, John Denver. Clean cut and wholesome, Rocky Mountain High, John Denver. Singing for the point of view of an eight-year-old, Denver reminisces in the song about a Christmas when Daddy drank too much and fell underneath the Christmas tree and made Mommy cry. He asked Daddy to show some restraint this year because he doesn't want to see his mother cry. Denver didn't sell many records with his tune, but for some people, this sentimental song will be all too relevant during this Advent Christmas season. And it reminds us, it reminds us that the holiday memories aren't necessarily happy in many families. Blue, blue Christmas. But the scripture says comfort. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. 
Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard surface has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she's received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the wilderness, wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low, and the rough ground shall be come level, the rugged places of plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all of humanity together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken this. My friends, here is God's word for us and for our life right now. If you're in pain this Advent season, God is here to comfort you. Perhaps you're in Greece over the grief over the loss of a loved one. Perhaps this was not the kind of year financially you'd expected, especially with COVID. We live in a prosperous country, but not everyone shares equally in it, and that can be particularly painful at this time of year. It's tough not to be able to do for our children all the things we would like to do. And of course, some people can't even put food on the table. Or perhaps you received a bad medical prognosis for yourself or someone in your family. Perhaps your marriage is coming apart. What an awful season to deal with family problems. And of course, and of course, this year especially has been hard on everybody as we're battling COVID and all of us in one way or another have been affected. And people are tired, are tired of it all. And it's difficult not to get down, even depressed in this holiday season. Whatever your heart breaks this day, God wants to offer you his comfort. Advent says, first of all, that God cares about a broken world. Isaiah was speaking to a broken nation, and much of the nation of Israel had been carried away into exile. They longed to return to their homeland. And Isaiah assures them that God has not forgotten them nor forsaken them. Their suffering is almost over. See, God will, will build a vast highway over which they can travel through the wilderness from Babylon back to their home in the promised land. And in the New Testament, John the Baptist cries as soon God will build an even more important highway linking humanity with God through Christ Jesus. The message is the same. God cares about a broken world. God cares about broken people. Brian Abel Reagan's father used to tell him a story every Christmas when he was growing up. It was about a little boy who was very poor. His widowed mother struggled to make ends meet. And the little boy had only one toy, a sad little car in poor condition. It had only one window and two wheels. The roof was smashed in, but that boy loved the car. It was almost Christmas and the boy knew there would be no presents, but he was excited anyway. It was the first year he would be allowed to go to midnight mass on Christmas Eve, and he couldn't wait. He knew that before mass began, people brought gifts to the Christ child. And he had been told the gifts were magnificent jeweled chalices for the altar, new clothes for poor children like himself, and envelopes full of money. The little boy wanted very much to give the Christ child a present. And so he set out to earn money before Christmas to do just that. And on the afternoon of Christmas Eve, he sat at the kitchen table, counting out what he had earned. He had enough money to buy a fine present for the Christ child. But before he could put the money back into his pocket, his mom returned home. Oh, son, she said, what a good boy you are. Now we can have a real Christmas dinner. And she scooped up the money and hurried off to the market before it closed. The little boy was heartbroken. What was he going to do? Well, you've already guessed it, haven't you? On his dresser, he saw the broken toy car, and he knew it was the only thing that he had to give to the Christ child. So he put the car in his pocket, and when the time came, he set off for Mass. When he arrived at the church, it was already filling up, and he walked timidly to the manger scene, which was set up before one of the side altars. 
Magnificent gifts were already piled up before the Christ child. And the little boy laid his broken toy car amid all the treasures. He squeezed into a pew close by just as the organ began playing the prelude. About this time, one of the ushers took a last look at the manger scene to see if everything was in place. And suddenly he spied the car. Who would leave a piece of trash like this at our Lord's crib, he said loudly enough for the boy to hear. The usher picked up the toy car and threw it across the church. The little boy was crushed. There was no time for him to retrieve his gift. The organ was playing and the procession had begun. And then suddenly everything came to a dead stop. To the amazement of everyone present, the baby in the manger came to life and crawled across the stone floor. He crawled until he reached the broken car, and then carefully he tucked it under his arm and crawled back to the manger. By this time, all the people had fallen to their knees. At this point, the priest rose and approached the manger. There, just as before, was a plaster child with a halo, but now he smiled and his arms were folded tight around a broken toy car. Brian Abel Reagan remembers hearing his father tell this story, and he resented it. He didn't like his father. His father had problems with alcohol. The song, Please Daddy Don't Get Drunk This Christmas, could have been written for him. When his father wasn't passed out drunk, he was a foul-mouthed terror, and Reagan had a difficult time forgiving his father. He felt his father was trying to use this story to manipulate him into being a more obedient son. But with time, however, Reagan came to put this little Christmas story into perspective. As I think of my father's Christmas story now, says the grown-up Reagan, I realize that I cast him in the wrong role. My father was not the good little boy who gave his last plaything to the Lord. My father was the smashed car. He was a wreck. But despite or because of all this, he clearly longed to be cradled in his Savior's arms, to have Christ still seek him after he had been rejected by everyone else. And here is why we call the story of Jesus good news. God cares about the broken world. God cares about broken people. That's what Advent and Christmas are all about. Comfort, comfort my people, says the Lord. Jesus came into our world to identify with the world's suffering. That's the whole point of the Advent season. Advent comes from the Latin. It means to come. And Jesus came into our world that he might be able to walk in our shoes. Stephen Arterburn, in his book, Flashpoints, tells about a remarkable young woman named Patty Moore. When Patty was 17 years old, she was a promising student at the Rochester Institute of Technology in Rochester, New York. One day, a bus she was riding on stopped for a traffic light at a busy intersection. An old man on the sidewalk caught Moore's attention. He was disheveled but clean, and he carried two loaded shopping bags, one under each arm, and he moved very slowly. Each step seemed to be a challenge for him. This was an awakening for Patty Moore. It suddenly occurred to her that older people had special needs, special difficulties, and this became a major motivator in her life. After graduation, Patty moved to New York City and accepted a job with a prestigious industrial design firm where she began to design products with older people in mind. With each assignment, she would ask herself, could my grandfather, whom Patty loved, greatly manage this with his aging eyes and hands? And then one day, Patty decided to go even further. With the help of a friend who was a makeup artist at NBC, Patty decided to spend several months disguised as an older woman. She wanted to discover for herself how America treated the elderly. Her friend fitted pieces of latex to her Patty's face to instantly age her. And she wrapped her legs with ace bandages and then she wore support stockings over those bandages to bind her movements. 
And she put wax in her ears and to make her hearing more difficult and drops of baby oil in her eyes to cloud her vision. And she wrapped adhesive tape around her fingers to simulate arthritis and wore gloves over the tape. And Patty Moore discovered, much to her dismay, how the world treats the elderly. She reported that she was ignored, shoved, cheated, ostracized, and even mugged. When I, when I was in character, she said, Afterwards, if I got a smile or a hello from a passerby, I felt as if I had received a hug from God himself. Her experiment changed forever her thinking about the needs of the elderly. Indeed, it's also influenced the thinking of industrial designers and politicians and others who learned about Patty's work. The only way that Patty could learn about the needs of the elderly was to experience for herself what it was to be elderly. And here's what's so majestic about the coming of Christ. God came to us in a tiny baby, not as a grown man or a woman, but as a tiny babe. Other religions of gods that come to earth, but only the Christian faith speaks of God who emptied himself completely and went through the entire human experience. God knows the challenges we face. God knows the pain of being human. The highway that God constructed between heaven and earth is a two-way road. God came down to us so that we might go up to him. This is so important. Dr. John Claypool tells about an experience he had when he was a very young pastor. He was called to minister to an old farm widow. Her husband had just died, and John Claypole went to offer as much comfort as he could to her. But he was young. He had never lost a person who was close to him. His knowledge of grief was abstract and academic. He did the best he could, but there was no way that he could really understand what she was going through. Then an older woman about the widow's age came into the room. She embraced the grieving widow, and all she said was, I understand, my dear. I understand. And someone told Reverend Claypool later that this second person had lost her husband just six months before. And Claypool writes, I could almost see the bridges of understanding coming to exist between them. The woman, who, the woman who had shared the same experience as my grieving friend had a way of connecting to her, had a way of making clear that she understood and that I was not able to because I had not walked in her shoes. Friends, God has walked in your shoes. God knows your pain. This is the gospel. This is the good news. God cares about a broken world. God cares about us. And Jesus came into our world to identify with the world's suffering. And this brings us to the last thing to be said. The manger of Bethlehem is as much a part of the Christian faith as the cross of Calvary. I love the way Isaiah puts it in verse 9. Ye who bring good tidings to Zion, go up on a high mountain. Ye who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. Here is your God, my friends a helpless babe in a manger of Bethlehem. Here is your God, baptized by John in the river Jordan. Here is your God, teaching and healing beside the Sea of Galilee. Here is your God, hanging on the cross of Calvary, making the ultimate sacrifice to show his love for a sick and dying world. I don't know about shouting like Isaiah prescribes, but it reminds me of a little gospel spiritual, amen in which the preacher tells the whole story of Jesus while the congregation sings behind, Amen. Amen. Yeah, that's the way it is with God. This is who God is. In the words of Isaiah, he tends his flock like a shepherd. 
He gathers his lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Here is our God. God cares about a broken world. Jesus came into this world to, to identify with our suffering, and the manger of Bethlehem is just as important to our faith as the cross of Calvary. Look in the manger of Bethlehem, whatever your need may be. Here is your God. In the manger, God is here. Amen.